Okay. Next, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Jay Bomester from locally here in Wayne State, and he's going to talk about the practical considerations for SBRT. Well, thanks very much, Brian. And I want to thank uh, Stan and the rest of the organizing committee, as well as AAPM and RSS, uh, not only for the invitation to speak here today, but, uh, but uh, for bringing this conference to Detroit. Uh, and I hope all of you have enjoyed your time here, uh, viewing our city that's uh, um, in, in a full upward swing. We even had the Tigers put on a show for you the last two nights, uh, twice in a row in extra inning walk-off fashion. So hopefully some of you got an opportunity to see one of those uh, two games. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about practical considerations in SBRT. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. I'll also show some vendor, pictures of vendor products and, and uh, data, uh, primarily those that we use in our department. So I have two objectives. I'm going to uh, review clinical implementation and continuous quality improvement for an SBRT program, and then we'll talk about some current open questions in SBRT, and I'll show you a, a little bit of the literature that uh, uh, that is out there uh, that I happen to throw in this talk uh, for, uh, for this particular topic. So uh, practical considerations is so, uh, sort of a catch-all and Stan uh, basically gave me the green light, said you can talk for 30 minutes about anything you want. <laughs> now I have a wife and four kids between the ages of four and 11, so you can imagine uh, your first Sam question is uh, how many times in the last 10 years has someone said to me you can talk for 30 minutes about anything you want? Um, now, Stan did a great job, as well as some of the other speakers, in talking about clinical implementation of SBRT, so I don't want to belabor this point. And these bullets are straight out of TG 101, uh, Section 7. Um, and so this has really been uh, well established and well presented here already. So I want to talk a little bit about some CQI processes uh, for our SBRT program. So we uh, implemented SBRT initially for lung uh, around 2007 or so. Um, and so in 2010, when TG 101 came out, we had a relatively mature SBRT program. Uh, and then shortly after that came out, we were going to initiate our spine SRS program. And the primary reason for that, uh, for those of you who don't know, we're only about a mile away from Henry Ford. And so each morning I come into my office, I look out my window, and I see Indran sitting there with a big smile with his big neon sign that says, we invented spine SRS. Bzz, bzz. So, no, I just made that up to see if you're still paying attention. Uh, we implemented Spine SRS because we wanted to offer our patients the best possible care and also contribute to the mounting data on the efficacy of this treatment, uh, a la RTOG 0631. So here we are uh, shortly after the publication of TG101, uh, looking at implementing an additional uh, uh, body site to our SBRT program and thought, now is a good time for us to step back and take a look at everything we do and how we do it. And so we took TG101 apart and really dug into the details of it. Uh, and that's the first thing you see here. We also uh, did a fair bit of end-to-end -end testing on our systems, uh, reevaluated our IROC results, and uh, did some external peer review. Each of those things I'll talk about here. So uh, the first thing we did, as I said, is uh, really dug into TG101. And uh, this is just the front page outline of a document that we put together where we assigned each individual group or groups uh, all the sections of TG101 to really flesh this out. And uh, the entire document, this is, like I said, this is just the front page. The entire uh, document is obscenely long. And just going through and making sure that we are uh, uh, making good on all the recommendations of TG101. And so I just broke out one little section here. This is the section seven, and just to give you an example uh, idea of how we assigned each of these individual tasks to individual groups, and then came back together and compiled a complete document uh, to make sure that we were uh, living up to these recommendations. We went out and bought ourselves a fancy end-to-end -end phantom. As you can see here, we have the ability to make measurements in the spine, uh, spinal cord, vertebral bodies, uh, simulated lung tumors of various sizes, uh, film and OSLDs, as you can see here uh, in this plane uh, through the, uh, the spinal cord as well, and made a lot of measurements with this uh, this end-to-end -end phantom, some of which I'll show you in some slides uh, coming up. 
And so this just gives you an example of one of the plans we created, uh, the IGRT, and then some of the film results coming from the, uh, the film that we put into that end-to-end and, and, and phantom. Um, we also uh, evaluated our RPC tests, uh, as it was known back then, and we did the head and neck phantom uh, many years before this on all of our machines. Uh, we had also already done the gated lung phantom, uh, but we had not yet done the spine phantom as we were initiating our spine SRS program, so we ordered and delivered that. And you can see each of these three IROC tests here, and the blurb below each of which shows that we have satisfied the criteria uh, for these tests. And those criteria are shown here for the head and neck phantom, 7% and 4 millimeters, which of course uh, no self-respecting physicist would implement those uh, tolerances at, at such a loose level in their own clinic, yet uh, for all these years, about 25% of people taking this test are failing this test, which has been a source of consternation for us for many years in the profession. Uh, the lung phantom, as you can see here, a little tighter in the point dose measurement, but a little bit looser in the uh, DTA for the high gradient region. And then the spine phantom, same TLD point uh, measurement uh, criterion as the, uh, uh, the head and neck phantom, uh, but the gamma pass criteria for the film are significantly tighter, uh, indicating the, the heavy emphasis on uh, spatial accuracy for uh, spine SBRT. And then lastly, uh, we commissioned an external expert to come and take a look at our entire program from start to finish. And uh, this external audit along with the IROC testing that we did really uh, helped quite a bit. Getting external uh, uh, input on your program really helps you sleep better at night when you're for example, pushing 18 gray uh, single fraction isodose lines around a patient's spinal cord. So, your first SAMS question. Uh, the passing criteria for the IROC head and neck, lung, and spine phantoms are 3% 3, 3 millimeters for all three, 5% 5, 5 millimeters for all three, 7% 4 millimeters for all three, or individual uh, uh, t um, criteria for each test of 7%, 7 millimeters, 5%, 5, 5 millimeters, 3%, 3, 3 millimeters, or 7%, 4 millimeters, 5%, 5, 5 millimeters, 5%, 5, 3 millimeters. Okay, excellent job. Everyone's paying attention and probably has uh, submitted their own institutions uh, to this testing. So the answer is, of course, uh, number five. Uh, and shown here is a, a table of passing rates and uh, 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 passing cr criteria, as well as the year introduced uh, for each one of these uh, tests and some other IROC tests that are available for you uh, uh, to do external validation of your own systems. So, for the rest of my time, I'm going to talk about some open questions, and I wanted to do this uh, in the form of uh, a little game. I'm sure you've heard of the game, Would You Rather? I tried to make my slides into that, but it didn't really work so well, so I changed it to Does It Matter? So we're going to play a little Does It Matter here. And the first Does It Matter is, uh, does it matter if you use gated, uh, respiratory gated treatment? Uh, and so I'm going to talk about some of the pros and cons of some of these uh, open questions that are out there at this point. And so the first uh, picture I'll show you, uh, for respiratory gating is this one from Underberg in the Red Journal uh, showing on the top uh, an ITV from a 10 phase 40 CT and on the bottom respiratory gated ITV. And so when you look at the uh, reduction in normal tissue uh, here receiving the prescription isodose, you say, oh, well, that's an open and shut case. We ought to gate uh, all of our lung uh, SBRT treatments. Uh, and so since it is college football season, my friend Lee Corso will have something to say about that. And what does he have to say? Uh, well, they quoted him in TG 101 uh, here. Several reports have shown that the benefit of gated beam delivery is minimal and does not outweigh the increase in treatment time and complexity for patients with motion amplitudes smaller than 2 cm. So that's the vast majority of our patients, right? And so some of those reports are listed uh, down below here. And I have a figure from uh, the last of these three papers shown here. And this shows you uh, in the pink uh, motion of an internally Im implanted marker and in the blue an external surrogate. And you can see this is for three different patients. And for the first patient we have really good correlation between internal and, and external surrogate. 
Not so much for the other two patients. And so this really gives you a good glimpse of why gating is not for everyone. And the bottom line here really is well summarized in TG101 as well, which is that all SBRT patients with tar targets in the thorax or abdomen, uh, one should do a patient-specific uh, tumor motion assessment uh, for these patients to determine whether this patient is a good candidate for uh, respiratory gating, abdominal compression, or, or other uh, motion management uh, processes. So that takes us to our second, does it matter? Does it matter whether you use abdominal compression? Uh, so here's a paper that's already been referred to during this conference by Heinz Erling in the Red Journal, uh, looking at varying amounts of abdominal compression for a number of uh, SPRT patients, from no compression to medium compression to high compression. And so they demonstrated significant control of tumor motion in the SI direction. Uh, and these numbers here, you see from no compression to high compression, are the overall mean motion going from about 14 millimeters to 7 millimeters. So outstanding control of the motion of the target. Uh, the, actually, the only OAR in which they saw significant control of motion in was the pancreas. Uh, but you do really see significant uh, improvement of motion uh, for the lung, and here it is for liver SBRT as well. Again, significant reduction on the order of about 60% in the craniocaudal direction, about 40% in AP, and this isn't terribly surprising if you squish these things down that things have to go somewhere, that you might get a little bit of an increase in the other direction, so they saw about a 15% increase in the, in the motion amplitude uh, in the right-left direction. But it uh, looks like all is good, right? Abdominal compression works, and it, uh, it dampens the, the motion of uh, tumors in the liver and the lung. Uh, so what could be bad? Well, here's one paper from PMH, from the Red Journal, uh, indicating that abdominal compression results in significant variance of intra- and intrafractional tumor motion in the SI direction in comparison to the initial respiratory correlated CBCT. And they observed greater motion during the planning 40 CT uh, than during treatment for patients that had abdominal compression. Uh, and their uh, uh, reasoning for that, their suggested potential reasoning for that uh, was maybe differences in the way the sim therapist and the treating therapist apply the abdominal compression, or possibly it was uh, uh, anxiety of the patients uh, during their first encounter with abdominal compression, which is during the, uh, the sim 40 CT. Next one, does it matter which scan type you contour and calculate on? Now, this one has been discussed already within this forum, and Martha and others have uh, talked a little bit about this. Uh, so here I'll show you a couple of papers, and this one is looking at lung SBRT patients, and they performed a dosimetric comparison of OARs delineated on free breathing and average intensity projection scans. And the results were there were no significant differences in OAR mean and max doses. Uh, and that AIP can be used in place of free breathing for OAR contouring and planning. Uh, and there's another paper listed here as well. This one did it not only for OARs, but ITVs as well. They also saw similar dose distributions for free breathing, AIP, and MIP, uh, but recommended AIP for both contouring and planning. And as you can imagine, the use of MIP uh, has, has to be done with a little bit, little bit of caution, uh, particularly in regions where you have interfaces between high and low density uh, structures. Uh, and what other reasons what, what would you uh, expect there to be for their recommendation of AIP over MIP? Well, here are a couple. So this is a paper using dynamic MRI to create simulated 40 CTs, uh, and their resu results show that MIP-based ITVs underestimate the real ITV. So with this uh, DMRI, they were able to see the real ITV, reconstructed some simulated 40 CTs, and compared them. And the error here, as they showed, is strongly dependent upon patient-specific respiratory variability. And here is that data. So you can see here, this is uh, the uh, percent uh, underestimation of the real ITV as a function of this uh, um, uh, respiratory variability, and that was really just variability in the peaks and troughs of the respiratory cycle. And so you can see there's a strong correlation here, but if you take the average value of all the phantom and patient data points here, you see about a 20% underestimation uh, of the real ITV when using MIP. Here's another paper. 20 lung SBRT patients contoured with six different techniques, and those six different techniques from simplest to most complex, or maybe simplest to most comprehensive, uh, listed here. And here's the data in this study. Uh, and these names are not really that indicative of what was actually included, so I've added this as well 
uh, to show you which ones these are, from free breathing to MIP, all the way to including everything. And so when you look at the mean uh, ITV values here and you go from MIP to everything, you again see about a 20% difference. So the MIP is underestimating uh, the real ITV by about 20%. So that takes us to our second SAM question. Use of a MIP for contouring the ITV for lung tumors can result in, on average, about a 20% underestimation of the uh, actual ITV, about a 5% underestimation. It is the best approximation of the ITV, about a 5% overestimation, or about a 20% overestimation. Okay, again, well done. And the answer here is number one. And some of those results I just showed you. Uh, there's actually another uh, publication here referenced as well, uh, which is this one from MedFiz. And they actually showed about a 30% uh, underestimation when using MIP. OK, does it matter which delivery platform you use? Uh, this could be an interesting one. Uh, so remember that end-to-end -end phantom I showed you. Uh, we scanned that phantom, and we created four mock spine SRS uh, uh, structures uh, within the, uh, the uh, vertebral structure within that end-to-end -end phantom. And we then uh, exported those to a multitude of different treatment delivery platforms and created uh, plans on those platforms. So here you see uh, something we presented at Astro a couple of years back showing uh, these individual plans for one of these mock uh, spine SRS uh, targets on TrueBeam, Tomotherapy, CyberKnife, and Vero. And so we did see some systematic differences between platforms in terms of uh, gradient index and, and max doses, and also treatment delivery time, uh, de depending on target size, uh, between these different platforms. But the bottom line really was that all of these platforms met every single criterion for RTOG 0631 for every single one of these four mock cases. And maybe the more interesting question is, okay, this is what you say you can do. Can you really do it? And so this is a paper that we just published uh, in JACMP this year answering that very question. So we delivered these four plans uh, that were planned on each of these different systems on all of those in individual platforms. And these are the results from those measurements. So the ion chamber measurements and the vertebral body all within about 3% for all plans on all platforms. And gamma pass rates in that film region I showed you in that end-to-end -end phantom greater than 95% for 2% 2 millimeter criteria on all plans, all platforms, which is fantastic. So vendors out there, give yourselves a pat on the back. This is what we can do today with the type of technology that's been placed in our hands as long as we have the right people whose hands in which it has, placed, it has been placed. <laughs> so uh, if you have the right, with the right physics support, uh, we can with any platform out there and the appropriate uh, uh, commission, time given for commissioning and, and uh, 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 quality measurements uh, can realize better than 95% pass rate for at 2% 2 millimeters for all of these different platforms. So I guess physics groups involved in this gives yourselves a pat on the back as well. Now on your platform do you need a micro MLC? I think Winston showed this slide but I'll show it again since I already have it in my talk. This is a conformity index ratio uh, for 5 millimeters to 3 millimeters leaf width and 10 millimeters to 3 millimeters we leaf width. Uh, so here's 5 to 3, here's 10 to 3, and you can see there's sort of diminishing returns here as you get to larger and lar larger targets. So sure, if you're dealing with a 1cc target volume, when you go from a 5 millimeter to a 3 millimeter MLC leaf width, you might realize, uh, say, on the order of, of a 30% improvement in conformity index. But if you're out here at, say, 25 cc, you're looking at less than 5% uh, difference in conformity index between 5 millimeters and 3 millimeters. Here's another paper looking at a similar sort of thing. This is 5 millimeters MLC versus 2.5 millimeter MLC for IMRT on the left and VMAT on the right. Uh, and they showed relatively minimal differences between uh, uh, these two MLC sizes for typical spine sites where you might really need a micro MLC. Now, does it matter whether you use IMRT or VMAT? This is a good question. Uh, so here's a paper for spine SBRT, IMRT versus one arc and two arc VMAT. 
and the results indicate that 2-ARC VMAT is comparable with IMRT with a significant reduction in delivery time, essentially half the delivery time. And this is very important for our patients because the longer they stay on the couch, the more things move. Uh, so that's for spine SBRT. Here's something similar for lung SBRT. Uh, here VMAT was equivalent to non-coplanar IMRT and even slightly better than coplanar IMRT. And again, an even more significant reduction in delivery time. Uh, about a, a factor of three here difference between uh, VMAT and IMRT. Uh, and so here are the DVHs from that second study. You see the solid lines here are VMAT, uh, the, the solid thin lines are non-coplanar IMRT, and the dashed lines are coplanar IMRT. And you can see here uh, that the VMAT plans are as good or better than either of the IMRTs and probably the best uh, in this entire group. And so here's my friend again, and I, I somehow lost my picture of Lee Corso with his Wayne State Warriors helmet on. So uh, I could only find the one with the University of Michigan, so my friends from the U will be happy about that. Uh, and why not so fast in this case? Well, here is a point counterpoint in MedFizz that, hold on a second, 3D conformal is better than IMRT or VMAT for lung SBRT. And the arguments for this proposition, 3D is not susceptible to interplay effects. Uh, secondly, it's less affected by patient motion during treatment and MLC positional errors and modeling. Uh, and third, you can actually do Cine MV imaging to evaluate real-time tumor position. Uh, so what about the arguments against this proposition? Well, IMRT and VMAT are going to give you dosimetrically superior plans. In fact, in a lot of cases, significantly superior as indicated. I, I'm giving you one example publication here that does show IMRT and VMAT give you significantly better plans for lung SBRT. They're able to handle complex geometry better, particularly for adjacent uh, critical OARs. And also this interplay effect we're always talking about, well, hey, it's not really that big a deal anyway when it, when it comes right down to it. So. Next, does it matter which dose calculation algorithm you use? Okay, so this is a good one. Uh, there are lots and lots of publications out there about this, so I just narrowed it down to a couple. Here's an interesting one that just came out this year in JACMP. Uh, eight T-spine SBRT cases calculated using uh, uh, collapsed cone, AAA, and Acuros XB for IMRT and VMAT. Uh, and here are some of the results. And you can see, see that compared to Acuros XB, which is sort of assumed to be the gold standard in this study, uh, collapse cone overestimates and AAA underestimates uh, the true dose. And here are the DVHs corresponding as well for IMRT and VMAT. Uh, and these are the, the numerical data. Collapse cone overestimates target dose by about 3 to 5 percent compared to Acuros XB, and AAA underestimates target dose by half to 2 percent compared to Acuros XB. Uh, but let's look at a much larger study. This one comes from RPC. Uh, and they evaluated results from 304 irradiations of the RPC thorax phantom. Uh, and they compared convolution superposition, AAA, pencil beam, and Monte Carlo, the real gold standard. So uh, they found that pencil beam overestimates uh, by about 5% at the center of the GTV. Uh, remember, these are just at the center of the GTV in this RPC phantom. At the edge of the PTV, those, uh, those overestimates are going to be significantly greater because uh, that's where you really have the electron non-equilibrium situation. Convolution superposition and AAA overestimate by almost 4%, and Monte Carlo was within 1%. So that brings us to our last SAMS question. Differences in dose calculated in the center of a lung tumor, not in the periphery, in the center of a lung tumor using common com commercial treatment planning system algorithms are on the order of half to 1%, 2 to 5%, 5 to 10%, 10 to 20%, or 25 to 50%. Okay, good. Excellent job. So number two is the correct answer. And I give you the uh, results here from uh, Stephen Cry's paper in the Red Journal, uh, at which I uh, presented previously, as well as another paper out there, one of many uh, that uh, elucidate this concept. So I had a couple of other uh, does it matters. Uh, how many 40 CT phases uh, do you need? Indran covered that one. Uh, also, uh, what about uh, uh, density corrections in your ITV? Indran covered that one as well, which was good because I was pressed for time because I had so many slides, but 
everyone left me so much time, I probably could have hit those again. But uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, I want to conclude by acknowledging our team at Carmanos Cancer Center and Wayne State University. First of all, the best physics group that I could ever imagine uh, being involved with, uh, and I'll include our medical physics residents in that. Uh, they are all listed here. In addition, uh, everyone in our team from the administration at Carmanos, the physicians, residents, uh, dosimetrists, nurses, therapists, our radiobiology group headed up by Michael Joyner, and really everyone involved in the process of patient care at Carmanos Cancer Center, Wayne State University. And I thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, again, thank the organizers for inviting me to speak, and I will remind you that all four of us uh, who presented in this section uh, will be around afterward to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much.